uh, um, my name is Katie, and I run servingthespirit.com, which is a website uh, that's trying to help the holistic and spiritual and wellness and green providers in the area. Um, this is Des. As I mentioned in the email, he's my guru for, for marketing and promoting uh, uh, my business online. So I thought he would be very valuable to you all, so I'll let him take it from here. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Good evening. Okay, so um, as you may have guessed, and from here, what we've got is a slide. I put a little slideshow together, um, mainly just to remind myself as to what I wanted to talk about. Um, I did not get an opportunity to put together any sort of handouts or anything, so I see a number of you have notes, uh, pads, and, and pens. That's great, so feel free to take notes and let me know if you need me to slow down a little bit. Um, but yes, what we're going to cover today, provided the schedule permits, I've got lots to talk about and I'm hoping I can squeeze it all in and get questions asked and answered and so forth, is ways in which you can take your existing business, I'm going to assume that for the most part everyone here has some type of business that, uh, that they're running, um, and how to take aspects of that and put it online in such a way that you can build um, uh, automated systems that add to your bottom line revenue streams um, that don't take up a great deal of your time. That's, that's when I first started getting interested in, in doing business on the internet, that was the thing that cap captured my interest the most, is the fact that you can automate things, you can build systems and put them in place that, uh, that will attract prospects to you, that will put them through whatever sequence of events you want them to go through, that whatever value and content you want them to to have and whatever calls to action you want them to take, like joining your email list, for example, or or uh, contacting you by phone, or whatever it is that you want them to be able to do, and ultimately to um, purchasing from you, either hiring you as, as a service provider or buying something from you as a product provider, uh, and potentially adding in some other revenue streams that maybe you've never thought of before, uh, affiliate marketing and so forth, which we'll talk about in a moment or two. Um, so hopefully that sounds like what everyone is here to learn, because uh, that's what I got. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Okay, so yes, we're using the web to promote your business, to capture leads, and to add more revenue streams to your bottom line. That's the whole idea. Uh, and ideally, in a way that doesn't take up a great deal of your time once you've got things in motion. That's really the benefit of, of things. Um, how many of you, just by show of hands, how many have product-based businesses where you sell products? Okay, okay, and, and, and then service-based businesses, I guess, would be the other, the other half. Um, as far as, as far as the, from, from product perspective, is it safe to assume that everyone is dealing with physical product, like physical inventory that you hand to somebody or ship them in the mail? Okay, all right, um, that's kind of what I anticipated. So there's a, couple of, there's a couple of issues that come along with both product and service-based industries. When it comes to service-based uh, uh, business, it, from the perspective of taking your business online, the trouble is, is that for the most part, for most people, in order to provide the service, you need to be there to provide that service. And so that automatically limits your ability to scale the business without, of course, hiring and training clones of yourself to provide that service on your behalf, right? So from that perspective, what I would be considering is, okay, how do I maximize what I'm able to do from, from, uh, from a hours in the day perspective, and then how do I add revenue streams outside of that preferably automated, that supplement the income. Because I'm going to assume that if you are in business offering a service, that you enjoy offering that service, providing that service. Um, otherwise, I strongly recommend a change of work. <laughs> so you're gonna wanna do that, you know? You're gonna want to continue to serve people in that way. But like I say, there's only so far that you can go before you can no longer scale any further. Um, and at that point in time, you need to consider how do I build the business further? How do I grow more in a way that doesn't require clones of myself? And that's something to consider too, you know, if you want to get employees on board, of course that's something to consider. But there's a whole other slew of headaches that come along with that. And then as far as product-based businesses are concerned, the, the issue is a little bit less uh, because, you know, as long as you can produce a great 
deal of product, and that will vary from business to business, then, and of course store it, with, uh, inventory, and, and deliver it. So there's that, those mechanisms that need to be in place. That's a little bit more scalable. Um, and especially if you start to outsource things and so on, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But even, even still, I would be thinking the same way. So how do I continue to do what I'm already doing, maximize it to the point where it, it can't scale any further, and then from there, add extra sources of revenue to the bottom line that are preferably automated. Um, so that's what I want to get into a little bit with you all today. So if there's any questions, shout them out. Just just let me know, okay? It's a nice small group, so we can we can do that. <clears throat> okay, so there are, when, let, let's just talk um, primarily about your website. Does everyone have a website for their business? Does anyone not? Uh, so everyone has some type of website up? Um, just by show of hands, um, would you say your website actually does generate business? Who would say that? On a fairly on a scale of one to ten. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, let's see. Scale of one to ten. Two. Mm. Okay. And when it gen when you say generate business, is it mainly bringing? Is it generating a lead, like a phone call, or it generates? Yeah, more leads than actual conversions. Okay. And I would imagine, if I remember, you you do yoga, right? Yeah. So I would imagine that the conversion happens face to face. The actual sale. Yeah, usually they come into class and then they give me the money. Right. Okay. Okay. Does that normally get preceded by some conversation, a phone call or an email? I try, but you know, they don't often want to talk on the phone. Which it's like email is like the thing, right? Yeah. So yeah. sometimes I get to talk to them on the phone. Okay. Um, and how many of you have websites that basically, whether they exist or not, would make no difference to your business? No? So everyone's website is doing something. Okay, good. Um, let's see, let's go around a little bit. Uh, so you, what, do you, what do you do? I'm an architect. Architect? I do a sustainable straw bale natural building, and I also have a product that it's like EMF protection and stuff. Okay, and, and how does your website generate business? Um, well, uh, it has a lot of information and um, when people search, search certain words, they find me that way. Okay. Um, I also send out a lot of newsletters and emails, and so then that sort of refers. I have a blog, and they sort of circulate with each other. Okay, good. You have a you have an email database that you, that grows on, on its own, and you just blast out your newsletter too. Yeah, you know, I go to events and trade shows and collect names from that, but it, not so much that it grows. It's starting to grow a little bit more now through internet, online stuff, but okay, all right. Still, uh, in the beginning of that. So, for, so if I understand correctly, for the most part, your website acts as uh, a point of discovery, right? Someone is searching for something that's relevant to what you do because you've got constantly uh, updated content. Google sees that and throws your website up and you get yeah, some type my, of engagement. My WordPress blog keeps me up there. Right, okay. That's the main thing that keeps me up there. Okay, good. So you're well on your way. We're going to get into that in a minute. So there's two, when it comes to your website, there's two areas to consider. Um, and let me see. The first one is the, is the on, they call it on-site optimization in the, in the sort of internet marketing speak. And that is basically everything that you actually do on your website. And for a lot of people, they think that that is, they say, well, duh, that's of course, it's my website. I put stuff on it. That's what else can you do? But that's really only sort of half of the battle. And we'll get into... The, uh, the other half of the battle, which is your, of course, off-site optimization as well. So when it, comes to, when it comes to the stuff that you do on your website, there's three points to consider. Um, the first one is content, uh, which we were just talking about briefly. You say you have a blog, which is great. I highly recommend everybody has some kind of blog. And when I say blog, all I mean is regularly updated content, whatever that may be. It doesn't, a lot of times when you say blog, people think, you know, tell, tell them about your day and your family life and people just blogging like an online diary. That's one method of it, but of course, as a business owner, that's not what you're there to do. But all I mean by that is content that gets updated regularly. You're putting fresh material on your website, okay? Um, the second thing to consider is what I refer to as capture, which is to capture the details of the visitors to your website in some way so that you can then get in front of them 
instead of waiting for them and hoping that they will find you and, re and repeatedly revisit your website. Okay? So you want to try to find some way to capture some details of the people who visit your website okay? so that you build a, a database of prospects and potential customers that you can then present yourself to. Okay? And then the last thing is monetize. And this is where there are lots of different strategies and lots of different approaches, but you want to try to consider what can I do on my site what can I set up on my site that's always there and always active that gives the potential for people to give me money? <laughs> okay, because uh, in business that's kind of the general idea. So, how many things can I implement on my site without being, you know, uh, over the top and looking like uh, you've seen some of those sites that just look like a bunch of random ads and you can't tell what's what and what's going on? You want to have a point of focus. But you do want to consider how many different ways can I put systems in place on my website that allow people and encourage people to give me some of their money. Okay? So those are the three things to consider when it comes to on-site optimization. So when it comes to content, we'll, we'll just break down those three points real quick. The, the first type of content is your static content. And what I mean by that is the content that's on your site that's always there, that doesn't change very often, you know, um, your contact details, um, perhaps uh, an about page. In fact, one of the, the first thing to consider is the landing page or the home page. That is wherever, when someone types in yourdomain.com, what do they land on? What's the first presentation uh, of, your, of your brand, of your business that they get? So that's obviously, as you might imagine, a very important one. But what a lot of people forget to consider, especially if you do have a blog or some form of dynamic content, is that people don't always land on your landing page or on your home page. Um, sometimes when someone searches for a keyword and there's an article that you wrote about three months ago and that's what pops up and they click on that and they land, they go, they bypass your home page and they land directly on that post, that article or, or video or whatever it is that you had posted. So um, it is very important to have a good compelling short and sweet and descriptive home page, something that, that within the, uh, the first 10 second glance gives the visitor a great idea as to what they can expect if they go deeper into your website, okay? And this is, I, I, watch, I look at a lot of websites and I find that this is an area where a lot of people go wrong. They want it to look flashy or they want it to be you know, fancy in some way or they want it to have, the other, on the other side of the coin, the, the, the other mistake I see is they want a lot of people want to have all of the information on that first page because they think that's the only chance they're going to get. I've been telling everything about me right now because they're, not, they're going to hit the back button. That's a mistake as well. What you want is something that at a glance, if you were to, and I do this with my own sites from time to time, is I'll open up the computer and I'll just glance at the screen and look away. I won't even, like, I kind of blur my eyes and it's like, what impression am I left with? Because a lot of times that's the way people surf the internet. They click on a link, they land on your landing page, they go, mm, and then they make a decision whether they're going to go deeper or they're going to hit the back button. So if you consider that, you want that snapshot, uh, and of course it's different for everybody, so I can't give you exactly what to do. But definitely a good focus on images and not, um, you know, you don't want it to be kaleidoscopic. You want something nice and focused, but images that represent the, the brand that you're trying to portray and the emotion that you want the visitor to experience when they land on your website. Those are some interesting points to sort of consider when you're designing that landing page. Yes? Yeah, just, just the, Sorry, one second. Yeah. When you have more than one thing to um, on your website, okay, I had three different businesses, I guess you could say. Okay. And uh, what I what I don't know is what I should have on there. Should uh, on my on my home page right now? I have my CDs because that's what I sell. Okay. But, so what are these three things? You have okay. a CD product. I have CDs, which are meditation CDs for children and adults. Okay. I uh, teach meditation. Okay. And I also do intuitive readings. Okay. So uh, you know, there's three really different, or not different, but you know, items, and it's hard to know what to put on the front page. But there is correlation between those three things, and so what I would, what I would do is try to brand that as, a, a, like, those are three components of your business, mm -hmm. right? And so, the, so I, I would go up a level in the pyramid, so to speak, and, and put a presentation together that includes all of those things, and potentially others that you may get into as time goes on. Mm -hmm. 
So you have, um, I mean, the, the focus is on uh, meditation, uh, inner peace, spirituality, self-improvement, these kinds of things. And so, it, it just, do you have a, a, what's the name of your business? White Swan Spirit Art. Okay, so that, that has implications automatically. Um, the first thing I think of is, is Native North American. Um, and maybe that's just the way it sounds to me. I don't know if I'm unique in that regard or not. But, um, but so you'd want to take the name of your business, the concept of what it is that you want to give people, and put that together in some kind of overall presentation that can lead into the, dif the different facets of your business. That's how I would approach it, I think. Um, and the other thing you want to consider, and this goes for pretty much everything, is the reason why somebody is going to is going to um, patronize your business and give you some money is because you give them something that is, is a solution to some problem, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. It's it, it's a it's a problem solution kind of relationship that we have going on with our customers, and so if you can figure out the best way to phrase or present the problem that your ideal customer has, then that's, that would be the focus. Uh, and you figure out a way to present that in such a way. And, and, and yeah, again, if, when it comes to local business, you have a local geographical area that you cater to. But when you start to push things onto the internet, then you want to start to think globally. Even though people in you know, Lithuania are not going to come to your physical location, there may be things that you can offer you know, off of your website. Perhaps maybe you have a newsletter monthly that goes out with some great content in it that you can uh, have for a small, you know, $4.99 a month subscription fee. People can participate in that, for example. This is kind of what I was hinting at earlier about setting up ways that you can monetize your website. Um, and then there's ways in which you can automate all of these things so that you can then turn your attention back to your day-to-day -day business affairs and carry on that way, okay? So hopefully that answers your question. You had something? Oh, uh, well, no, I, I just wanted you to repeat the sentence that you said, and it was, uh, you want a short, sweet, 10 second, at a glance, images that represent brand, and then yes, after and that you said. Emotion. I don't know what I said brand after that. Brand and emotion. Yes, emotion, uh, yeah, absolutely, because of course we're emotional beings, and so if you can tap that, then you're going to have a much greater impact. But the, the, the real thing to about that, that presentation, is you want to be able to, in a very, very short period of time, address the problem. What is the problem that you have the solution for? Because people who don't have that problem are not going to buy from you, so that's okay. They can hit the back button. People who do have that problem, you want them to see it right away that you have the solution to that problem, whatever it is. So sometimes you got to think a little outside the box and get a little creative or what have you, and it's different for every business. but. You know, if you're in the yoga niche, and so, you know, I don't know, these are some, I'm just brainstorming, but the problem may be a, a feeling of getting old and stiff, a, uh, uh, you know, lack of mobility, um, a desire to want to be healthy and fit, or what have you. If you can, if you can tap into something that is uh, a fear-based issue, that's more impactful, because <laughs> people would sooner do something to avoid a fear or, you know, than they yeah, will to... to to, that's just how it works, right? So, so if you happen to have a solution to something that people are afraid of, all the better. Yes? I have a question um, concerning Google box on mm -hmm. your first page. I've heard some things and I don't know if they're so, so I'd like you to clarify sure. again. One thing that I heard was that they essentially just scan the first page. They don't go through. They, no. They do go that, through the Yes, site. they do. Yes, unless you specifically put what they call no-follow links, mm -hmm. um, which if you don't know what that is, chances are you don't have no-follow links, um, then the Google box will follow every link and, and will, will spider all the way through your website. And they'll also follow the links that, that, you, that you give to other people. So if you link to a friend's website, they will follow those links as well. Right. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the way that when we're talking about that too, that's kind of the way Google gives you authority is how many links point to you. So if you have all kinds of friends and people on the internet that think your website is great and they link to it, then Google is going to up you in the rankings a little bit more. So yeah, we'll, and we'll get into that as well once okay. we get further into it. But yes, they will, they will spider your whole site. Yeah, that, that was essentially it because originally, I think maybe about five years ago or so, did they? Is I think the advice that came was you get the, the get words on your front page. 
Yes. That apply to everything. Yes. Right. The keywords, because Google does yes, work by keywords, keywords right? Website, yeah. You want to have your keywords on the pages you want people to land on. Google's going to see all your pages, but they're going to serve up the ones that seem the most relevant to what the searcher is searching for. So that's kind of Google's, Google's you know, mission. Um, so you don't really want to optimize every single page on your site? Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, you want to you wanna spend the most time on the pages that generate leads and generate business, of course, right? Um, and, and then everything else is, I wouldn't think about it too much, but if you write something, there's words there, that, so there's keywords, whether they're the ones you intend or not, right? And that's one of the benefits to um, having a blog, as we talked about, because if you're constantly writing something, then you're constantly adding fresh keywords for Google bots to, to chew on, and then to, so Google can serve up more of your website. Even if it's not the, the pages that are your money pages, that's okay. You're getting free traffic to your website, to your domain, right? So it is good to consistently produce content, and again, we'll talk about that. Yes? I just have a question. With a Flash website, mm -hmm. does Google go through that as well? Good question. Google cannot see Flash. So you're better to really just have flash pieces in the... If you have a little flash animation or something, that's fine. I don't use flash at all because yeah. the search engines can't see it. They don't know what it is. If there's words, they can't tell what it is. And so I get no, they call it Google juice. <laughs> I get no Google juice from flash. But it's okay to have pieces of flash. It's okay to have it. It yeah. certainly won't penalize you. It's just, yeah. just be aware that Google cannot see it. And if you have an entirely flash-based website, you don't exist to the search engines. Except That's your what I was domain. Worried about. I'm just changing it now. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. It is. It's yes, yeah. definitely change that. <laughs> and I recommend WordPress, incidentally. WordPress is the it's a free platform that you can install on any internet host um, and you can very easily manage very easily. I mean I've done it for a little while. There's a learning curve to it. But if you can learn how to use Microsoft Word or anything like that, then you can learn how to use WordPress. And it allows you to manage your own website. And it's, it's what's called a content management system, a CMS. So there's Joomla, there's a bunch of different ones, but WordPress is the most uh, widely used, and it's very well re regarded by the search engine algorithms because it, by default, there's a whole bunch of search engine optimization things that are already there that you don't have to think about or even know about. And so that's why I strongly recommend WordPress. Is Dreamweaver okay? Well, Dreamweaver is just a, a software that allows you to code your own HTML. Okay. Um, I still recommend WordPress. Yes, go ahead and use Dreamweaver because, but just bear in mind that if you want all of that optimization, then you have to learn about it and implement it yourself in your own code. And if you're not a developer, like I'm not a developer, then chances are that's going to be difficult. Can you put flash pieces easily into WordPress? And is it a program that you buy? No, it's free. Okay. It's just, um, if you go to your web host, uh, I use a company called Bluehost. There's a whole bunch of different alternatives out there. Um, and, uh, you can contact them and they should be able to instruct you as to how to install WordPress on your domain. And then you actually log into your website via any internet connected computer and you can add pages, add posts, drag graphics, do anything that you like. So what I'd recommend is, is, um, is to go to, um, I call it YouTube University, and, uh, and just do a search for WordPress and just watch a few videos so you can see how people are manipulating it and you can make more educated decisions that way. Okay. But it's, I do strongly recommend it. Does it, it take long to learn it enough? No. Get up no. 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 I, I have one. Oh, and I'm totally useless. <laughs> okay, good. I was going to say, your Dreamweaver HTML, the HTML that the Dreamweaver produces, can go into WordPress yes. as an option for HTML. Oh, okay. Yes, so, yes. so then those Press pages end up optimized. Then. Yeah, you can create something on, on Dreamweaver and then just click the source tab, mm -hmm. copy it all, and paste it onto a, a, a WordPress page. I may as well just start at WordPress, though, because I'm just going, I, I like Flash. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. I like to animate. Right, okay, yeah. But now I realize. I, you know, okay. Yeah, it can, you, it can be done. It can yeah. be done. There may be a, a slightly steeper learning curve, perhaps, if you're yeah. trying to implement it or integrate the two, but it yeah. can certainly be done. Okay. And a couple of courses at YouTube University will get you there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so we talked about the landing page. The, another page that I think is very important is the About page. So you want to have a, a somewhere on your site um, where you where you give the visitor if they choose if they're curious um, all of your best stuff you know who you are and the more 
the more personal and personable you can be on your about page, the more you will encourage people to do business with you because in a typical situation, people do business with people they know, trust, and like. And so the more you can get in front of people with your own personality, uh, assuming that you're likable, hopefully that's the case for everyone. Um, if not, you have to fake it. Okay. Yeah, or get a, get a, a spokesperson. <laughs> yes? So, I, a friend and I have been bouncing back and forth. I was inclined to write the about page in the first person. That's fine, absolutely. Yes, I recommend that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it's yeah, even more engaging. Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. I, see we were lot. Taught, I was yeah. taught years ago to always you know, my whole website is set up like Francis does this, blah, 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 blah. I, I, it's fine, it's not like the end of the world, but I would do the opposite. Because like I said, you want to develop a personal rapport with your visitors, if possible, whenever possible. It's, it's the way I think you'll have better results. So if you're selling like one person mm -hmm. business, yes. Uh, it's so I was worried about that too. So that's okay just to be honest about that. Absolutely, and, and just talk yes. About it as you're because I, I did write that on like because it's not actually up and running, but I did just say yeah basically that, and I was worried about that whether that would come across. No, I think I think that the more transparent and personal uh, mm -hmm. that you can be within reason, you know, yeah. right, yeah. Um, the the better. Um, because you, 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 it's an example, for example, okay, uh, I was watching some videos the other day, I've been getting interested in different diets and health and stuff like that, right? So I'm looking up some YouTube videos on the paleo, rest, paleo diet and some recipes that go along with that, right? So I'm, I'm poking around, I'm watching a bunch, and then there was this one video that had, I, I, I believe, a husband and a wife duo, and they're, they have a nice sense of humor, and they're in their kitchen, it's called caveman cooking or something like that. And uh, and they and they have such a uh, a sense of personality, and you can tell when they interact with one another, like their relationship and how it is, and that level of engagement made me want to watch every every other video that they made, right? And there was other good quality, instructive, uh, informative videos out there as well, but those that particular couple engaged me on a personal level, and uh, that the rest of the video uh, producers did not. And that will happen as well on your website, that will happen on your Facebook page, that will happen wherever you present yourself. So the more you can do that, the better, in my opinion. Yeah. And, uh, and nowadays, too, people are pretty savvy and people are pretty you know, aware, and I believe that that uh, extreme transparency is very important to business nowadays. So even if you're building, because I, I was, my plan was to, I already have a lot of product that I've done, like I'm an artist and I'm doing this wall or sort of thing. But I thought I wanted to get it up because it's been taking so long, so I thought I would kind of invite people to come while I'm building my website, sort of, and see what I have yeah. as I have and have that circulate around. Is that great idea? I'll yeah. And if you can start to get people to engage with you in an encouraging fashion as to, oh, I like how it's coming, I see the progress, and this kind of thing, that's fantastic. Because by the time you're up and full and running in full force, you've already got a whole bunch of people who are probably going to want to do business with you because they've been watching you develop all the way through. I think that's a fantastic idea. Yeah. Okay. So we thought we got your landing page. We got your about page. The next thing, of course, some type of contact page. You want people to be able to reach you. Um, that one is kind of self-explanatory. Um, if you're a local business, you're going to want to have local information, you know, your address and so forth. You can very easily, uh, especially if you use WordPress, you can very easily embed a Google map right there as well so people can actually see the directions, where you are physically. Um, and then, of course, any kind of contact data, in, uh, email, uh, you know, depending on what you do, sometimes maybe even your Skype username or whatever, again, depending on what you do and what kind of contact that you want. But obviously, it kind of goes without saying, but I had to include it. And then the other thing that uh, you want to have on your site is some type of frequently asked questions and pricing kind of information. They don't necessarily have to be on the same page, I just wrapped them together there, but um, over time, as you get engagement from people who visit your website, you're going to start to, to collect the questions that people ask you all the time, the stuff you're always replying to, and you know, you, you set up a text document with a cut and paste so you can paste the answer in and hit send. Put those types of things, make sure you address them on your site. So that the, the whole goal with, with a, a, an FAQ and a pricing page is automation. It's so that the website does what you would have had to do because somebody would have asked you the question, right? You want that to be automatic. And so that's an important thing, I believe, to have 
on your website. Um, and of course, that will develop as time goes on and you start getting more in, uh, engagement from, from your audience, you'll start to get more frequently asked questions. And, and as you start to split test and do all kinds of little business experiments, you may alter your pricing structures and so on and so forth, but you want that to be there readily available. So, you know, um, and I think it was like, I don't know how many years ago it was when I did a business course. And um, when they talked about advertising, they almost always said, you know, leave something out so that they have a reason to call you so that you can talk to them. Mm, not, not today. <laughs> no. You know, people will just go. Yeah, they'll just go to the next place. If they don't find what they're looking for, uh, okay, well, next, and they'll go back to Google and they'll type something else in. Yeah, you need to, you need to, you need to provide what the visitor is there for, you know, um, or else they will go somewhere else. That's basically it. I mean, maybe there is some something that you can, if you if you you know strategize a little bit, there might be something that you can strategically leave out. But I would play, I would be very careful with that. Uh, because, like I say, people are short attention spans, and if they don't get what they're looking for, if, or if it's difficult in any way, uh, you know, like like they can't figure out what they're supposed to click on, back Google, and they go somewhere else. Happens all the time. I'm guilty of it myself. I watch people like my mother-in-law is the worst. <laughs> so, if she can't figure out what button, to, she, not only does she hit the back button, but she curses that website uh, before she leaves. So, but that's just how people are. So I would all that the information. Yeah, I would give whatever you want them to have, whatever, whatever people who visit you want to know, you want to provide that, essentially. That's the general rule of thumb, I guess you could okay. say. Okay. Um, okay, so that's, those are some, and then of course, business specific, you may have other bits of content that, you know, that are unique to what you do, that are just static content. That's a page on your website that never changes unless you change what it is that you're doing. Okay. So that's referred to as your static content. Um, the next thing is your dynamic content. My little animation there. <laughs> now the dynamic content is the stuff that you constantly update, um, also known as the blog. Okay, blog is kind of a catchphrase, a hot word for some people. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, all that I'm referring to is content that you add on a fairly regular basis. So. When I had my, actually I did have my um, WordPress set up for me initially. Um, they said if you want to do a blog, it has to be your homepage. No, it does not. No, it does not have to be. So my, my homepage is a blog. It can be, and that's fine. Um, but is it giving all the information like you say like that? Well, it depends. It depends on who is your visitor, right? If your visitor is there for information that you generously provide out of the goodness of your heart, then you want them to see that first, yeah. right? If your visitor is there for the service that you provide specifically, if that's what kind of traffic you're, you're attracting, then that's what you want to present first. So there's two, there's, there's, it's not a set in stone rule there because you have to test these things with your own traffic, right? So a good way to do it is to, is to figure out some kind of call to action, like maybe you want people to join your email list, which we'll talk about in a minute. Very, very important that you have an email list. Nobody ever joins my email list that comes to see me. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll work that out. <laughs> then, then you can split test. You can, you can run your site for a while with a, with a, a constant blog as your landing page yeah. with an opt-in box of some kind that, and some incentive that gives them the opportunity to want to maybe give you their email address. And then let that go for a while and figure out what kind of conversion rate you're getting. And then you can then uh, um, uh, do a static landing page, like a home page sort of thing, with that same call to action and find out which converts higher. So you can, you can test these kinds of things for your own website. But you don't have to have your home page as your blog. In fact, if you go to Katie's site, servingthespirit.com, she has a home page that's static, that has content and information on it that's relevant to, to the, the visitor, and she has a blog that you can click on in the menu bar that will take you to the dynamic content, right? But like Des was saying earlier, I'm, I'm finding like huge portions of my traffic come in through the blog. Like they Googled something and they saw an article and then they clicked on the article and now they're on my website and I can see them moving around and like touching different things on it that way. Yeah. So they're coming through my articles. And if you have lots of traffic, you can watch it in real time now on Google Analytics. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, 
Um, so yeah, like I say, anything that is constantly updated. So uh, the first question I get a lot of times is, well, how am I going to think of stuff, you know, to write about, or what am I going to be publishing on my website and so forth? A couple of suggestions. One of them is industry news. Um, if you're, uh, you know, if, if you're providing something and you're in a particular industry, there's a good chance that you know a whole lot about it, more so than the average person. And so just whatever interesting news is going on, just write a couple of paragraphs about it. And the blog post doesn't have to be a thousand word, you know, epic article of any kind. It could be, you know, a couple hundred words with a nice picture on the side. Um, just be careful with pictures, don't just grab them from Google because there are copyright issues at play. Um, you can get images from Google if you know how to do it correctly, but the better way to do it if you have even a small budget is to just buy them from stock photography sites. You can buy, the way I do it is I use a site called iStock Photo and there's another one called Dreams Times and you can just buy a bunch of credits and so I buy a hundred credits for whatever and then whenever I need a picture I just search there and they're excellent, professional, high quality images that you can then freely use without any royalty or Dreams Time and iStock Photo are the two sites that I use. So, and you can go, if, you, if you're savvy, you can go to Flickr uh, Flickr.com, which is just a, like a social media site for people who are into ph photos and imagery. And you can find, you can do a search and you can actually specify only show me results that have what's referred to as a Creative Commons license. So you can then use those images as long as you give attribution to who, they, who the owner is. Sorry, what would you call it? Creative? Uh, creative Commons license. What if you have so like, in your blog a your URL a lot of pictures? Is that still a copyright issue? If you, if Say that again? If you URL, do you URL, you just link your picture links directly to the, where it comes from. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't do the say that's picture, but it, it's a link that goes. So you yeah okay well it's kind of a gray area because although you're giving you're providing the author with a backlink, which is in in internet uh, in the internet world that's a great thing you're not necessarily giving them attribution. And the Creative Commons License Act or whatever um, requires that you give attribution. Um, so, you know, photo courtesy of blah, 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 with the link that's clickable that will take the, the visitor to that, to that page. There's, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is one downside, potentially, with using Creative Commons licensed photos and providing attribution in a link is that you're providing a portal away from your website. <laughs> so visitors click that and boom, they're not on your website anymore. And they might like where they landed and they never come back. Um, so that's the one caveat. Okay. Yes? Yeah, I try to get a hold of people who have an image that I want to use mm -hmm. and you send them countless emails and they never reply. No, it's just is easier that, to buy is them that from that my not stuff. an answer in itself? <laughs> Perhaps so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so much easier. If you have a small budget, just just buy some credits at some place like Dreams Time or iStock Photo because the images that you get are going to be awesome and you're going to have full rights to them and you can make them link to whatever you want them to link to. So when someone clicks the image, it takes them to the full post, maybe, of your blog posts or what have you, right? Because sometimes you'll see just an excerpt and they'll say, click here to read more, but some people, people naturally click on pictures. So they click the image and it takes them to the full posts or what have you. Do you know what the cheapest one is? Uh, I don't, no. no, you'll have to poke around a little. But another thing, if you're looking for free images, is do a Google search for clip art and royalty free images. And you may stumble upon some things like that. Um, in, a, in a lot of cases, sometimes you stumble on some great stuff. In a lot of cases, you get what you pay for, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, yeah. I remember like um, somebody telling me not to kind of join, like, you know the whole linking, mm. you want to be linked to all these types of people, but they said don't join like every, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the word, but every, like you can, like for, for example, I'll have to give an example because my brain isn't working, but um, in yoga, there's like um, Yoga in Canada. The directories. Yes, yeah. the directories. Yeah, in my opinion, unless there is something shady about a particular directory that you've learned about or that just is the vibe you get, be everywhere. Uh, in fact, that's, it's coming up on the slide. <laughs> be everywhere is the key online. Because the, the way I think of it is, is, is not only from a search engine standpoint, because you're getting all of these backlinks, 
but from, uh, a, uh, from the, the perspective of point of discovery. You want to have as many points of discovery on the internet as you can that so funnel people sort of to your site. So your presence. No, right? no, be everywhere. Yes. In fact, uh, I recommend I recommend building as many links as you possibly can in any way you can think of. Even like. Even well, what about like like so? Um, people talk about high quality links as yes. opposed to low quality links. So if you're like linked to somebody who gets no traffic, that's not. It's almost like you're doing them a favor, not. Yeah. yeah, but you're, it, it depends. If you have, if you link to them, if you link out, that doesn't do you any, well, I shouldn't say it doesn't do you any good. It doesn't do you very much good. It does a little bit of good because it lets Google know that, that, you know, you're trying to build a community and be a part of some kind of community because you link out and people link to you. So there's a little bit of that. But it's the, it's the backlinks, the links that point to you that live on somebody else's website that are of, in right, place. so these directories do that. They link yes. to you. They have a listing and the, that people click it and they land on your website. Yeah, so that's what they, that's what's called a backlink in, in uh, internet marketing sort of SEO speak. So backlinks are, and, and I have a slide about that. <laughs> backlinks are huge. They are the largest portion of the way in which you get search traffic for free. Because you can buy traffic too, that's a whole other thing we'll talk about as well. Okay, so industry news we talked about. Uh, original articles and videos is obviously fantastic if you have the time for it, um, because uh, not only not only for your readers uh, or visitors, uh, you know, for that so that they'll stumble on something they've never seen before because it's unique and it's original, but also for Google. Google's algorithm is amazingly complex and verges on artificial intelligence. And Google can can tell if the information on your website is the same as everybody else. <coughs> if, if you have duplicate content, um, if you've you know cut and pasted something from somewhere uh, that's interesting to your audience and pasted on your website, your audience may never know that it's from somewhere else, but Google will. Yes. So what if you're a contributor to regular online magazines? Mm -hmm. So that was when I contribute to those magazines, I also put it on our website. Yes. There's nothing wrong with it, it's 100%, uh, uh, but there is potentially, if, if their website is a higher authority in the eyes of Google than yours, yes. then the, even though the content is on both sites, theirs will be the one that gets ranked okay. for the key phrases. But they'll still link back to me from that site, so there's yes. nothing wrong with it. No. Like it's not going to deteriorate that it's on multiple, the same articles on multiple sites? No, not so much. It just means that the site with the highest authority is going to be the one that ranks for whatever key phrases are contained in that article. Okay. But if they're giving you a backlink, that's yeah. fine, go for it. Okay. Because the backlinks are all important. Mm -hmm. And especially, yeah, yeah, because Google's uh, spiders are going to follow that backlink and realize that they're, they're giving you attribution. Gotcha. Basically, okay. for, your, for your content. Um, okay, so original articles, videos. Uh, I, I strongly recommend video for anyone who's not sheepish or shy to be on camera, or even video where you're not on camera, where it's a slide presentation with you speaking over top of it, a voiceover. Fantastic. Uh, for one, for a couple of reasons. One, video is is uh, satisfying all the senses, so it's easier to get emotional engagement when people are listening, watching, reading, you know, the whole thing. Um, and the other thing is it allows you to place your content in other parts of the internet, like YouTube and Vimeo and those kinds of places. So now you have more points of discovery that are large and highly trafficked, YouTube in particular. I don't know if a lot of you know this, but Google, of course, is the biggest search engine on the internet. And anyone, anyone know what the second biggest search engine on the internet is? I don't know, Bing, I got the computer. YouTube. 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 It is not Bing, it's YouTube. And, incidentally, Google owns YouTube, oddly enough. So you want to be in YouTube as well, if you can do it. Um, and there's many, many ways to do it. If you do, um, let's say your, your, your thing is writing, and you do blog posts, maybe, for your dynamic content. If you want to be on YouTube, put up a, an image or a slideshow of some kind and read your blog post and record it. Turn it into a video and put it on YouTube. Put some nice description underneath it, some keywords so that it gets found in the search, and people will have an opportunity to stumble upon your content on YouTube. And you can even embed that video onto your blog if you want so that people can read your article, and for those who are too lazy to read, they can click play and listen to you read it to them. So you're catering to more than one kind of visitor. Yeah, you giggle, but I tell you, it's powerful stuff. If you can repurpose that content, 
Um, so if you could, and that's that's another part of, and we're going to talk about this later in the implementation section if we get there. I don't know how late we're going to go here, but can I just give you a quick example of that? We we have a weekly newsletter that's outrageously way too long because we have so many events that happen here, mm -hmm. and um, so for we got lazy last week, but for three weeks in a row. We did that. We took the article list and we just did a four minute reading yes. of it. If they wanted details, it was in the body, they could click on it. Yes. And in the second week, we got 70 new people subscribing to our email address. And we usually get like five to eight new people um, a week subscribing. And as soon as we did video, it was crazy. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. It's huge. People don't realize you know, there's a way to put it all together to sort of take one habit, like writing an article every week or every two weeks or whatever your schedule allows, that you can take that one bit of effort and syndicate it all over the place so that you have massive backlinks and points of discovery for, for actual visitors, not just the search robots, right? So definitely, yeah, excellent way to do it. Now you can go a step further than that and take that same piece of audio and put it into an RSS feed. You can do it on a WordPress blog very easily just by creating a category. So you could say your category might be podcasts. And then any post that has audio on it, click the podcast category, and then it becomes a part of that feed. And you submit that feed to iTunes and now to Apple. And now you have a podcast in iTunes, which is also a search engine that a lot of people forget about. So again, you've taken that one piece of content, and you've got now you're in uh, you're going to rank in Google because it's text. You're going to rank in YouTube because you've turned it into a video, and you're going to rank in iTunes, which is. You've got to be in iTunes if you want to really, because so, no one's there. It's a it's a untapped resource. I shouldn't say no one's there, but it's so in, in comparison to Google and YouTube, it's the world is your oyster on iTunes because Do we have to sing. No, 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 no. no. As a podcast, I don't. Does anyone listen to podcasts? No, you do. The podcast is just like a talk radio or whatever, except it's on demand. You subscribe to whatever interests you, whatever that that uh, a publisher publishes a new. Uh, episode, it automatically downloads to your iTunes, you can put it on your iPod or your phone or whatever you listen to things on, and great for if you do a commute or whatever, to, uh, like, I listen to podcasts and my wife likes it because I'll put a podcast on, and I can't just stand there and listen to podcasts, so I start busying myself and the dishes get done and the floor gets, gets vacuumed, right, because I'm interested in what I'm listening to, so it's a great way to educate yourself while multitasking. Uh, but you can pr produce your own podcast, it's more... To the, to the point of what we're talking about tonight. And young people don't read. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, seriously. Untrue. Totally untrue. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I don't know. Seriously, if, if you give a lecture in class and then you put it on, on a iTunes and tell them to listen to it, they'll listen to it and not listen my, to class. My kid is 11 years old and reads a book twice a week or so. That's your kid, but you <laughs> just talking generalities. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, my, my daughter has a website of her own. She's six years old, and it's called readwithsophie.com. Feel free to. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't read at all. If I want to read a book, I'll find it in audible.com or something, and, and I'll listen to it. That's the way I prefer to consume. And that's just, that's just me. That's what, I, that's what I like. So the goal is, is, ideally, you want to be able to cater to all of those types of people. That's really the bottom line. Um, so, and you can do that with the original piece of content that you start with. And so, that's whole idea of repurposing and leveraging what you've already got for maximum impact. That's the idea there. Okay? Um, oh yes, the other thing is curated content. Now, we talked a little bit about the whole uh, duplicate content issue. Um, there's a lot of sites that uh, get, all, get their traffic by actually finding information all over the internet and bringing it all into one place so that their audience doesn't have to go sc scouring the net. They know that every time they log into this particular website, they get interesting, relevant information to whatever they're there for. So there is a way that you can curate content as long as, just like with the Creative Commons licensing issues, you provide attribution. You provide a backlink to where that content came from and that you add your own voice to it. That's important. Um, so if you just cut and paste some interesting stuff from all over the internet and put it on a post and then publish it, that's, um, that's going to get you penalized in the search engines. But if you add a couple of paragraphs at the top that, gi that give your opinion and feedback and add your voice to it, and you give a backlink at the bottom, for example, that says to read more about this, click here, and that takes a, a, a visitor to where the original article is from, then you won't get penalized for it. Um, but you do run into the issue that I hinted at before, which is that you are giving someone an opportunity to leave your site. And so you want to weigh the pros and cons of that, right, with your own, with your own website traffic. Is it worth getting in touch with the person you're quoting? 
letting them know you're quoting them. You can. And asking for a backlink. You can, absolutely, in order to get, maybe perhaps get a back ring, but also to, to let people know, like to make relationships in your niche, yeah. to let people know that you found their content interesting and you're going to share it with your audience, because people like that. I mean, that's, it's like, oh, I did something and you like it, and you want to tell all your friends about it? Of course I like that, right? It feels good. So yes, you can do that for the purpose of building a relationship and potentially getting a back link, for sure. Um, when you're developing your site too, like oftentimes if you put a link in, there's an option to have it open in another window, which is sometimes like a little way around that. Like they go to another site, but yours is still open behind it. Yes. So that's helpful too. Good idea. Yeah, yeah. Word, WordPress is real simple for that. Yes, you can do that very easily in WordPress. Okay, so curated content, once again, the, the pros, it's easy. I have, a, I have a piece of software that I bought that's called One Page or Page One Curator, and it'll actually, I can put in a whole bunch of blog uh, feeds, RSS feeds, and I can just search. And I'll say, okay, I want to talk about, my audience is primarily musicians and audio enthusiasts, so I want to say, okay, well, I want to talk about mixing and mastering in Pro Tools. So I'll search for that, and I'll find all kinds of content and YouTube videos and everything. Whatever looks good, I can copy and cut and paste, put it all together, put my thoughts on the top, put the attributions at the bottom, and hit publish, and it puts it on my website. So the reason I'd like to, I like the curation is because it's simple. I can have a thousand words on a post, but I only had to write a hundred of them, you know, which saves me a great deal of time. The, the cons, the downside is, as I mentioned, your first, it's not original content, and so there's potential that you won't get the same juice from the search engines because they know the content existed elsewhere first, um, and you're giving the visitor an opportunity to leave your site. So something to think about, but it's a great way to get content on a regular basis if you have a very tight schedule. Okay? And then the other thing is interviews, and interviews are absolutely fantastic. If you have the time and inclination to do them, if you can find, make connections with people in your niche, in your industry, um, that are hopefully interesting to listen to, um, if you can do even just little short ones, little five, ten minute interviews that you can record, transcribe, and per repurpose into all those forms of content that we were talking about, that is a great, great way to do it. For a